Good evening, and thanks for joining us for episode four of Hot Topics with Hot Rod. For safety's sake, maintaining safe water building systems in the 2020s. I'm Erin Hollihan Haskell, president of HeatingHealth.com, and we've had a ton of fun partnering with Kalefi on this webinar series. So a huge thank you goes out to Team Kalefi for all of their hard work behind the scenes. And thank you to Bob Hot Rod Roar for sharing his knowledge with us. So here he is tuning in from his workshop on Know-It-All Lane, our friend and industry expert, Hot Rod Roar. Well, thanks for the nice intro, Aaron, and welcome everybody. And actually I'm in my office and I was too hot out in the shop, so you might notice a little different background, but uh, I got some air conditioning going on in here. So yeah, so the topic tonight is gonna to be mainly on uh, uh, domestic water. We're not talking about heating stuff tonight. We're gonna to talk about, uh, call it the potable water, or domestic water, basically the water that we drink, that we shower and stuff like that. So a little different, uh, a little different uh, spin than what I usually talk about hydronics, but I think I got some really good information. I got Kevin on board with me. He's up in Milwaukee and he's gonna field questions. And uh, he's done this presentation quite a few times too for different uh, ASP and ASHRAE ASH groups. So um, he knows the information we're gonna, maybe banner back and forth a little bit to make it a little bit more fun and interesting. So let's get rolling here. We've got a couple of housekeeping slides. Yeah, this is the typical, if your system is uh, giving you a hard time with the uh, connection or something like that, that's a tech support line for uh, for the GoToMeeting folks. Uh, they can sometimes help you through a, a connection issue. Most of the time, if you have a bad connection, if you just um, log out and log right back in, it'll, it'll clear it up for you. So. Um, uh, we'll, we have the, all the back issues that we've done so far. We've had have them on the uh, YouTube channel, both ours and also at uh, Heating Help. So if you want to watch one of the past ones, and this one will be up in probably a couple, two, three days uh, from now, we'll have that uh, archived also. So if you want to watch it again or share it with somebody, uh, there'll be a couple places you can find it and do that. And so, yeah, so that's where we've been, and uh, that's where we're going tonight, episode four. And then, uh, yeah, we're going to think about what to do for the fall season. You know, we like doing this, and we think it's pretty well received. It's just, you know, we've got to come up with fun and uh, interesting topics for, for you and me. So we're going to take a little bit of a break and then, uh, you know, re-examine it a little bit maybe more in the fall. I think people might be getting a little webinar uh, weary right now with the summer and stuff. They want to get out and uh, do things. So, uh, but we'd love to do some more of it. So... In the spirit of our chairman, that uh, Marco Kalepi over in Italy, he was uh, generous enough to give uh, a, a million euros to a couple different hospitals there in the area to help with the COVID thing. So we're, we thought we would do the same thing after that dollar amount, unless Aaron's going to step up for a million euros. But uh, I don't know if you can read it over here, but the, they shared that with a couple hospitals, one in uh, Bogor Monero, close to where Kalepi is, and then one in uh, Milano at another hospital there. So that was a uh, it was impressive as uh, you know our president to do that. So we want to go along with that. And I'm going to let Aaron talk about this mission a little bit more. I, I read up on it a little bit, but I think Aaron has a, a little bit more information on it. And that's what we're going to do is $2 per attendee up to $500. And uh, the past ones, thanks everybody for the past uh, fundraisers that we've done. We've, we've pulled in some good money for these different charities. So thanks for your support on that. Thanks, Bob. Yes. Uh -huh. What Water Mission builds safe water, sanitation, and hygiene solutions in developing nations and disaster areas. Today, they are providing urgently needed solutions to at-risk communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Both, both HeatingHelp.com and Kalefi will donate $2 per each individual who attends tonight, up to 500 each. So just by tuning in, you're helping us support those in need and combat the spread of COVID-19. If you'd like to learn more about this charity and the great work that they're doing, visit watermission.org. And thank you so much. Yeah, thanks everybody, that was well put. I did go there and I, the, what I learned just tonight before I logged in is that there was a husband and wife that started this after uh, uh, Hurricane Mitch, I think it was, hit Honduras years ago, what was that, 98, I think, or something like that, and um, he was an engineer, an environmental engineer, and uh, the Greens, their last names, and uh, they just said, you know, let's just keep this going, so it's been a pretty popular, and uh, uh, they do a lot of good work all over the world, both for, like Aaron said, for domestic water, but also for wastewater, too, trying to, you know, go into places where uh, they can help with that, so we think that's a good one that fits nicely with tonight's topic, so. Yeah, thanks, Gales, for doing that. Now, as far as the topic on water specifically, uh, we don't have a, a product for um, 
you know, filtering water or that, but we do have a couple of things that towards the end I'll talk about that can help with some of the issues with water in these buildings, especially buildings that have been uh, uh, vacant for a period of time, which is Legionella bacteria. So uh, we're aware of that being an issue in the industry and the world, really. So we do have a couple of products that we developed for the world market, for the European market that we've recently in the past couple of years uh, brought over to the U.S. So we'll talk about um, how those work and what they can do for you and the, and the whole reason why we have a product like that. So, and those are two of our hydronics that we talk about that in detail a little bit more. So, so Legionella, and, you know, jump in any time here, Kevin, on this, because I know you've done a lot of research and you've got a lot of background on this. Now, there's other bacteria that can certainly be in your water from uh, Giardia, that, you know, from cattle or something near your well to, you know, iron bacteria and a lot of different bacteria, but I'm going to focus on the one that most of us hear about. It's in the news almost every day somewhere, uh, Legionella bacteria, just because it is, um, uh, it can be deadly, number one. It started our awareness, I think, in the U.S. probably started with the, um, you know, the Legionella get together in Philadelphia years ago. And uh, if you start looking around, it, what they've discovered is there's probably been more uh, cases and outbreaks of that that were, you know, written off as a flu virus or something like that. So, once it's in the news and once the uh, legal system gets a hold of it, uh, you know, it's hard to ignore this. Um, I was recently in Florida with one of our reps down there. We're driving, uh, we were going from Orlando to, uh, I think, Tampa somewhere, and we're going across one of the interstates down there. There's actually billboards down there. I think you might have get, uh, contacted Legionella at one of the theme parks. You call this certain attorney. There's attorneys that just, <laughs> you know, in that corridor focus on uh, Legionella of all things. So go figure. But that's, uh, you know, once it's on billboards and the words out like that, you know, we've got to, um, well, I've got to address it in any case, but it's, uh, you know, once it's on people's mind, it seems to get a lot more attention from all the different uh, code administration people and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's, that's the, all, um, all good stuff, Bob. Well, good stuff. You know, another reason, too, is you mentioned here the flow rate in the mains dropping. The the low flow fixtures uh, are a main contributor to this. So we're, we're bringing much, uh, you know, less water in from the municipality, right? So um, that water is older. So the, the water sits in the buildings and we have old water uh, much more than, than we used to. And yeah, um, you know, with, with more testing point. and yeah, the, yeah, the the water age is is a big contributing factor. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, the uh, retirement age people, uh, seniors. Uh, mm -hmm. There's more of us these days too, so there are more people that are susceptible. So quite a few reasons for the cases being on the rise. And then the testing too, the data you mentioned there too. They're coming out with specific tests now. Yeah. So, and that when you talk about the, uh, you know, how, you know, low flow on everything, shower heads, toilets, hand sinks, uh, even when you go to a, you know, a public restroom, they've got little low flow faucets. So that affects not only the piping in the building, but also the water mains out in the street. You know, they're not getting as much flow as they did well, going back years. Um, so they get uh, biofilm can grow inside the mains, the public mains. So that's where we're going to go with this next. So what is, uh, first of all, where the water starts out, the public water suppliers, what are they doing about it? So uh, <clears throat> let's do something a little fun first, and we'll do a little, we got a couple of trivia questions tonight. This is the first one to win the uh, Hot Topics t-shirt. So um, this was a club one. Aaron came up with this. I like this too. Um, it kind of wraps up everything that we've talked about over the last uh, three episodes of this. So what can water do that no other substance on earth can do? So we'll give you a couple minutes to talk about that. Did you know the answer, Kevin, when you saw this? No, I don't. I, I still don't. So I'll learn right along with the rest of us. Yeah, once I read the answer, it said, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But you, you don't think of about <clears throat> that only water can do this. So we getting any responses there, uh, Mary? Kevin, I don't know who's watching the poll numbers. Actually, uh, we do have uh, an answer from Gary Klein. And yeah. his answer is, is that water can be in three phases at the same time. Does that well, sound yeah. right? Yeah, we, we can be in three phases. It can be a liquid, it can be, a, you know, steam can be a vapor or it can be a solid. So that's exactly right. <clears throat> I didn't think it's at the same time. That puts another twist to it. I didn't think that far along. I just knew that it could be a, a solid liquid or a gas is what uh, the answer that I was, I say, I, Aaron, was looking for, but we'll take it. He's, he's right. And uh, I'll leave it to an engineer to have that on the tip of his tongue, right? Hi, Gary, by the way, we've, we've talked and we've worked a little bit together. So thanks for tuning in tonight. What do you think, Kevin? Good answer. All right. I, I was so going to say ev it evaporates, but maybe other things evaporate too. 
Yeah, well, uh, well, what is esteem, I guess, eventually. So here's the thing about Legionella. It can be, uh, it is an airborne virus. So, you know, going even back to the Philadelphia outbreak, they're not certain exactly where that came from. If it was, uh, they say the cooling tower, that was the most uh, logical, but it could have been a water feature. It could have been in the shower, but just that it got so many people at one time like that, they kind of, uh, they kind of look to the uh, cooling towers, maybe the cause of it, but this is kind of uh, different places where um, you can get it airborne, where it can be in the air, the cooling towers, of course, on the left there, and water features, you see more and more places are filling in their water features or turn them into gardens or turn them into something other than a, a water feature just for that reason, and I'm thinking, gosh, Vegas, all these years, all those fountains and all those uh, displays and stuff, and that one wall of water at those uh, recent uh, area uh, on the Strip there, hotels, I'm thinking, and all that time and money to build those and now they're shutting them down just uh you know for the potential to be spreading this bacteria it's, it's out there it lives in the ground it's 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 around us all the time it's just that once we get it uh you know moving around through the systems that we can breathe it and uh, either from a the mist from a shower or walking by one of these features or again in the cooling tower uh, vapors that's uh where we have a problem and swimming pools even a, a home spa i suppose if the temperature gets right that's a perfect uh, uh breeding ground for it So what, uh, if you have water that comes from a public water provider, they're bound by certain uh, regulations. There are different associations. There's just different rules and requirements, especially if they get public funding or they get government money. They have to meet all these mandates for testing. And the group that kind of watches all that and keeps track of all that is the AWWA, the American Water Works Association. And so over the years, they've come up with um, a way, a, you know, policy and a, uh, a checklist of how you can disinfect the water mains and starting right at the, uh, the source of the water, what they can do to treat the water and then make sure that their mains are treated or, or tested occasionally to do it. So their job is just getting the water to you safely. Once it's in your building, once it's in your lines, then it's your responsibility to maintain that water. They just go to the, you know, to the end user with their uh, liability, I guess you would say. So the thing that they worry about is, uh, you know, right now, of course, is lead pipes. So they want to keep the, um, they want to keep a little bit of a biofilm inside their water mains to keep any leaching of uh, well, brass or, or lead out. So it's, it's kind of a juggling act that they want to keep a little bit of film in there, but not enough film that, you know, bacteria can have a, a nesting ground or a breeding ground and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a tricky balance for them to, uh, to be able to do both those things. So, um, you know, we're assuming they're doing their job and now it's up to us to take it from the building in and, you know, how we do that is going to vary a little bit. So I had an interesting, uh, attended an interesting webinar here maybe a month or two ago that some of you folks probably know Ron George. He, he writes for the magazines. He's on a lot of different committees. He does a lot of training. He's an engineer. This is kind of one of his pet topics right now. And he was generous enough to share some of the research he did, which saved me hours or days of digging all this stuff up. And he presented this to the ASHRAE, uh, was it Detroit chapter here just in July, I think. So this is pretty current information, but yeah, he had 50 slides like this where he really drilled down on, you know, how they do the um, disinfecting. And, and what you'll notice up here is on the, um, <clears throat> the flow rate for flushing up piping. It's not that unlike what we do in hydronics, where you have to get that flow rate up to a certain uh, velocity, which we call feet per second is how we measure that to make sure that you're moving that um, uh, the chemical that they put in through the pipes and that you can get it, you know, in contact with the uh, film on all sides of the pipe. If you think of a uh, what's the example show there, like a 12-inch main, just a trickle of water going through it where one person's open to the faucet, it's certainly not going to move um, all that water through there to be able to flush that pipe out. In fact, that's a little demo that um, I tried to put together just to have a shop uh, theme to this. I wanted to put a demo. I said, well, how could I best do that? So Max got, uh, got together with me and had some pretty good ideas. So we're going to show the demo first, and then we'll come back to... Uh... So here's what it kind of came down to at the end after I had this all done. I said, well, Here's the two worlds colliding. Here's a, you know, just a backyard plumber and myself thinking of how I could demonstrate this. And here's Ron coming up with, uh, and, and Kevin too, will show some of the slides that he researched, coming up with all the data, coming up with more of a, an engineer's approach to how you would approach a problem like that. To me, I'd say, well, you just need to move more water through and we'll just open all the taps until that happens. But, you know, uh, you have to have a little bit more documentation to it, especially if, uh, you know, if there's a health safety issue that's uh, involved with that. So. Uh, what do you think, Kevin? I thought this was a, a clever way of, you know, presenting that, showing the size of the pipe and what kind of flow rate you would need through that piping to uh, uh, to get up that three feet per second that the AWWA is is recommending. Yeah, Ron always has really good detail in his slides. So you can spend five minutes on some of these. 
Yeah, well, that's the thing. Some of the slides were so complicated. My eyes were starting to cross just trying to read it all and make sense of it. But that's, uh, I mean, it's all pertinent information. It's just, uh, you know, these slides are available to everybody that's viewing tonight. So if you want to read through this a little bit more, but that's the bottom line of this. You want to show what kind of flow velocity it would take to get um, uh, to, to scour different sides of Maine. So <clears throat> these are some of the sources that are available right now. You know, who's doing what as far as uh, giving us some plans or giving us some information to build on. So we've got the ASHRAE standard down here, the 1088 standard. Um, when it first came out, people said it didn't go far enough. You know, it said you got to develop a plan. Basically, well, okay, how do I develop a plan? What should be in my plan, Matt? So uh, it's getting, they're drilling down a little bit more. What's happened is some of these groups got together. You can see the CDC's involved now. The NSF is involved. The ASHRAE is still involved. So they're trying to, you know, make it more than just a, a suggestion. Here's the things that you can do, and here's how you would do it. And uh, you'll see as we get to the end that Ron's put together a, a little assessment plan too. That's oh gosh, about 15 pages of information on uh, how you would check and document and what you would have to do to protect your building. So again, assuming the water gets to your building safely through the uh, the public water provider. Yeah, and 188, you know, Bob, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, no, that new version, that, the, the 2018 version is written in enforceable code. So they changed the verbiage so that an engineer or designer can literally you know, cut and paste sections of that into a building spec, uh, which was really nice. It was a good improvement to that. So it's a great document. It's not really very long. So I'd encourage you know everybody who's interested go ahead and read it. Uh, it's it's not you know too long and too deep. It's easy to understand. Well, that's good because sometimes that can get a little bit too uh, where you have to be an engineer to understand it. But you can see up on the top that he put a red box around. One's a guideline and one's a standard, and that's what Kevin's referring to. So this is an enforceable, which will probably be uh, built into the codes here soon. You know, it takes a couple of years to these to make their way into the different uh, codes that we have around the, uh, around the country and of course for the different uh, jurisdictions to adopt that code also. So, uh, but this number 12 uh, is uh, the difference between the guideline and the standard, Kevin, is that what the verbiage means there? Yes, yeah, the uh, 12 is, is really nice too. It's a great read, it was just updated, but what it does is it gets a little more specific. Um, it, it actually talks about um, you know, uh, storage and thermal disinfection and copper silver ionization and other things. It gets a little more detailed on what you can do instead of just saying you have to have a plan and you have to have a team that's responsible for the plan. It actually gets gets into some good, good, really good detail. So these would be a, where the, a building owner, let's say you're a, a hotel chain owner or something like that, you would go to one of these and you could add on to this. You could certainly build more into the, uh, you know, a plan that you have for your own buildings or a documentation, how you're going to keep that documentation or who's going to be in charge of this. And that's, you know, I think that's what the, the industry has encouraged the building people to get involved and know about this and what to do about it and how to, uh, how to test and keep the buildings maintained safely. So, all right, so here's my demo. I think I can just click on this here and I look at my IT personality with that. Now I'm going to talk through this one. I didn't, it was a little noisy when it was running. So I, uh, when we first tried, I said, ah, you're not going to be able to hear me talking. So basically what I did, I thought I'd make it green look like a Legionella. If Legionella is a color, I would assume it's green. So I made a big column of water there. So that's a piece of, I don't know, I guess it's about an inch and a half IV pipe. And uh, I filled it up with room temperature water. And well, I'll just start running this and we'll show you what I did. So basically I wanted to, show what would happen if I had just a little hand sink faucet running there at uh, about 0.35. We put, actually put a little a flow setter on it to get down to a certain uh, flow rate and watch the column of water, the green color there, and see um, how long it takes to you know flush that column of water. And that's the only five feet of inch and a half pipe. So think of that, you know, the previous slide talking about a 12 inch main or a bigger main like that. Um, it took uh, you know about a gallon and a half of water to flush out of there before you can even see the green color start to disappear. And if you're close to that, you'd see that the water doesn't just flush that whole column out um, cleanly. It just kind of trickles through the center around the edges because as you can see the flow coming out of that faucet versus the pipe that's uh, feeding that. It just um, it just didn't flush it out. So we looked at that with both a um, uh, infrared camera we had on it also to try and see the change in temperature as we um, um, as we uh, as we were running that, so 
Now let me get back to my slides here. Thanks, Max. Um, so yeah, so that's the, the difference between a power flush and just opening the water is you just got to move that whole volume of water. So now every building's going to be different in that respect. You know, if you got a three inch main going through a building or if you got a 12 inch main going through a, a skyscraper somewhere, you got to know how much water to go through there. And here's an example, again, out of a, uh, a job site that what it can look like after it sits for a while in those mains in a building that hasn't been used for just a short period of time, just a few months uh, period of time that water can get stagnant and uh, pick up the uh, bacteria if it's in the piping is in the biofilm and stuff like that so now you're going to have to flush that main until this color water goes out of there and you get down to this color and you, just, you know that you pulled the new chemicals uh, that were put in by the public water provider have been pulled back into that building the chlorines or the chloramines or whatever different chemicals that they're using so the tricky part the part that we still don't have an exact answer to are what we call the dead end legs in the building so if you got a couple of risers going up to the building and you branch off for you know maybe different wings or something like that, how do you assure that that whole system has been flushed, that you've got water down to the very end of every one of those dead legs, insufficient amount of flow to get to this three feet per second to adequately um, flush those out? So it's not going to be an easy thing to do on a big building. You're going to have to go in there and uh, you know get some way uh, uh, moving a lot of GPM to flush those pipes out um, adequately. So. Yeah, and your video really things showed things. that how to you know if that if that fixture was on a dead leg, right? You, I mean, you yeah. ran that for for quite a bit. Now that's a really good example of flushing the that stagnant water just in that little piece of pipe. If, imagine if you had 50 feet, you know, from that fixture back to the recirc line or something. How much you have to open that fixture to get that dead water out of there? And I don't know that you could through a little, especially if you got a, a you know a flow restricting faucet like that one there. I think it had a 0.35 aerator on it because it was a uh, you know a water saving you know a lab faucet there. So at some point you almost have to come in with a pump or something like that or be able to open a big flow. And that's how the the public water providers do it. They'll open a hydrant on a on a water main to flush enough GPM out of there to make sure that their chemical was contacted all the piping. Obviously, you don't have that. Uh, ability in a hotel room in fact even if you could you probably wouldn't have enough drain capacity to handle that kind of flow rate to do that so there's some unanswered questions out there but at least people are thinking in that direction and, and, and trying to come up with a plan so um, we think thermal disinfection at Cleppy is probably um, the best way to do it you know because it can be done with the equipment that you probably already have in the building just elevate the temperature and recirculate it through the building for a period of time at least on the on the hot water side of it so the question becomes, well, what temperature, you know, how much um, do we have to raise the temperature in that loop and for how long uh, to do that? I know, Kevin, you know a lot about that, so I'm going to let you talk to some of this too, but um, there's a couple different, I'll just bring up all the talking points here. Yeah, sure. Well, to do this, you have to have you have to have an electronic mixing valve, right? And here's a few examples of those types of valves. You can't do it with a thermostatic mixing valve uh, without making some kind of bypass piping and doing a manual. I mean, it's just really not practical. So uh, you can do it. All these valves shown here have the ability to elevate the temperature for that period of time. Uh, and like you say here, Bob, 10 to 30 minutes kind of depends on the, the type of system and how old it is. Um, and then we get that question to activate daily or weekly. Uh, you know, how, how often do you have to do this? Well, that again, depends on the size of the system. But uh, like you said, Bob, it's, it really is the best choice. Uh, you know, you're not adding chemicals that you have to control. You're not spending money on those chemicals. They can be dangerous. Um, it's better for the environment. You don't have to dump any water to the sewer. You can actually just elevate the temperature and then return it to normal so you don't have to waste any of that water. Um, and you know, th this has been used in Europe for decades, uh, that point there. So it's a proven technology. This is not new to North America. It's just that we, uh, we're just now starting to do it with these electronic master mixing valves. And once you have this in place, if it's already controlling your domestic hot water, uh, everything's already there. You don't have to even spend any more money. Uh, you can just elevate that temperature and, and do this. And we're going to have a, another slide uh, you have later, Bob, shows exactly how we do that, you know, the actual process. We'll talk about yeah, that again. Thank you. The one gray area out there is what temperature, you know, and for how long, like Kevin said, and that would depend on the building. Uh, I mean, like I said, I was in a building recently down in the Oklahoma City that's been closed for, gosh, months now. In fact, it's, it 
half the building was roped off. It was a, I think it was a Hampton, I stayed, no, it was a Marriott, actually. They had the parking lot roped off, they had half the building roped off, so you couldn't even go down there. So, you know, that building, it's going to take a bit of water to get every one of those, let's say there's 50 rooms on that side of the building, you know, every one of those um, pipes in that building is going to have to have new contact with the water. And the other thing that happens with, uh, you know, going back to that earlier slide with the water providers, they're having these same issues is that, you know, the uh, chemical that they put in has a, I don't want to call it a shelf life, but it has a period of time that it starts to lose its efficiency. And if those mains aren't being flushed through adequately, they're not keeping up with, uh, you know, the chemicals that are dissipating, just, you know, getting used up as they're sitting in that piping. So they've got to deal with that on their end to make sure that the water, you know, is safe, uh, that the chemicals stayed in it until it gets to your uh, your final use. So getting back to these temperatures, wasn't it the state of Illinois, Kevin, that was trying to say maybe we should uh, require 160 degrees? No, the reason I think it was, is the, yeah, I think it was the city of Chicago. Um, okay. that was trying to do that. I don't know that that ever happened or they, that they went through it. There was a lot of feedback uh, relative to that, but uh, you don't really need to do that continuously. I mean, of course it would kill the bacteria, but just think of every, all the other, um, you know, the things that would happen, you know, yeah. the equipment that's hard on the equipment, that's, that's you're gonna have a lot of uh, scale, you know, increased scale, right, Bob? Because at that temperature, you, you're gonna have more uh, skate hard water deposits coming out of solution and um, what yeah. you want to do is just elevate it just long enough to kill the bacteria and then let it go back to normal. I think what the, maybe somebody there was thinking, I don't want to speak for the city of Chicago or whoever, probably some engineers that said, you know, if we go to 160 and we've got mains that have a, or buildings with uh, pipes that have a lot of biofilm, maybe it takes that high a temperature to make sure you get through that biofilm and you get all the contact with all the bacteria. I think it, well, I'll show you some pipes coming up here with maybe a half inch of slime on the outer wall that they say, well, maybe that 140 degrees isn't gonna to get to the bottom of that slime layer where stuff could be living in there. So maybe that's the reason that they talked about it. And also I think in Europe, Kevin, some of the standards over there say, your time period can be short at the higher temperature. So instead of going 30 minutes, like we show here at 140, you can get it over, so to speak, quicker at a higher temperature. So, but yeah, your your equipment's gonna take the hit on that. And uh, of course the cost to raise the water up to 160 degrees and then obviously mix it back down to a, a safe usable temperature. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things to uh, that you have to think about when you uh, start talking about elevating that temperature. And then you need some way to trigger whatever's generating your domestic hot water when this valve says, okay, I'm in that mode. I want you to go to a high temperature for your uh, bacteria protection mode. You've got a trigger through the, you know, we've got a relay in here that you can do that. But the device that's making your hot water has to be able to accept an input and says, okay, at that time of day, I'm going to elevate my temperature so that the building has that temperature available. It's one thing to, you know, ask for, but the, the equipment's got to be able to, you know, have the uh, logic built into it that it can go to that high temperature, so. Right, so if your yeah. building has an a electronic master mixing valve in it now, uh, and you go back to occupancy, you know, from being unoccupied back to occupancy, then you can easily just set this valve to do the disinfection. Um, so, the, I mean, that's a lot easier than, than uh, you know, getting a bunch of chlorine and, and dumping that in the system and then dumping that down the drain and that kind of thing. So and it's another advantage of having this kind of valve. Yeah, and like Kevin said, we've had these out for years over in a lot of different markets throughout the world. So we think we've got a pretty good idea on what um, what does work. I mean, there's been Legionella standards in Europe and Germany, different places for what, 10, 15, I think 15 years now, I think they, they were telling us in Italy, they've had a standard that they had to, uh, uh, build to, you know, build a valve to and build a mechanism to. So that's where we look to them for, okay, what have you been doing over there? You know, that sometimes it's easier to copy a, a standard or a, you know, procedure that's already been built and tested and proven as opposed to, okay, where do we start? What temperature we use and how long? So this is a, a maybe a little better graphic of that that shows the, um, you know, the, the issues with supplying a building, like Kevin said, with a super high temperature, certainly 160, even 140 degree water you know, the potential to uh, the seconds that it takes for somebody to get a second degree burn is considered if you raise a, um, a red spot of blister on somebody's skin, that's considered a second degree burn. And that's where, of course, the uh, legal issues come into play when somebody gets burned like that. So with that in mind, you're gonna have to protect every single um, tap in a building, whether it's a tub, whether it's a sink, whether it's an eye wash station, a bidet, whatever it might be that has hot water going to it, you're really gonna have to look into uh, putting point of use uh, you know, a valve right at every one of those fixtures to give you that adequate protection. So when and if the building goes up to a high temperature at a 
you know, midnight tonight or whatever it might be, uh, think of this red line here, this hot line is going to have 140 degrees if somebody gets up you know, to use a faucet or something like that. We've got to protect them under all the different conditions that this uh, temperature could be at. So that's where it's going to get a little bit more involved. You're going to have to start looking at these point of use valves like a 1070 valve. Some of the shower valves like single handle valves have that built in it or could have that built into it. But if you have a, a two-handle tub valve like this, or even a two-handle lab faucet, or even the single-handle faucets that you see in a lot of uh, like public restrooms, you know, we just put your hand under it and warm water comes out. Well, they've got that mixed underneath to give you that temperature uh, that comes out of that because you don't have any way to uh, to regulate that or adjust it. It's a hands-free uh, type of application. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of questions, and we're trying to come up with a lot of answers for all these questions. Okay, we're going to do this. You know, help us out with uh, uh, ideas, with products, with piping diagrams, and stuff like that. And this kind of talks to what Kevin and I were talking about, uh, uh, activating the, uh, uh, with some relays to activate, the, you know, both the pump and also the um, uh, the higher temperature mode of the uh, boiler, the indirect tank, whatever might be uh, providing a lot. You can tank with a lot of these smaller hotels now that we visit these um you know, little interstate ones have uh, tankless water heaters. You drive up to the building, you'll see like six or eight vents coming out of the side of the building, which are all tankless water heaters. So those are going to have to know that uh, it's that time, uh, you know, to go up to their high temperature mode to provide this uh, this disinfection cycle. Yeah, and, and this slide shows how the, the Calefi Legio mix actually does it. So it's interesting. Uh, I can go through that. So yeah. uh, it's the only valve, by the way, uh, Bob, that will automatically do this thermal disinfection cycle. In other words, there's a there's a calendar and a clock in the Legio Mix controller, and you can set it up if you want to to automatically perform this thermal disinfection. And how that works is, let's say, uh, um, you know, if you look down at that line graph, you designate that at 2 a.m. Okay, you're going to start your cycle. So what the controller will do is it'll elevate. Uh, the source temperature up to 160. So there's a contact output that says, okay, uh, heat source, go to 160, or if it's already there. Um, what it does is there's that relay three over there. You can see that it will, or excuse me, the relay on the right, it will make sure that your recirc pump is running. For example, you want to make sure that's running. So that's in that relay is wired in parallel with your time clock or your aquastat or whatever else is, is controlling your recirc pump. Uh, and then it's going to automatically change its mixed temperature set point. So what you m might normally have set at, uh, say, 130, if you look at that graph, the dark red line, that's my set point. Okay, that's my mixed temperature set point. So the controller will, at 2 o'clock, say, okay, let's go uh, to 160. Let's make sure the pump is running. Um, and it will it will increase that supply temperature up to 150 and the dotted line there what that is is that's the return temperature and actually that's the most important temperature so when we start the cycle the controller will watch the return temperature sensor and as long as it gets up to 140 then these are examples you, you can change any of these it will say okay i'm there i'm at 140 i need to be there for 30 minutes and it will watch that return temperature and make sure that you have a total of 30 minutes within this period from 2 a.m. to 3 a.m., okay? And if your controller will do that, if your system will do that, then the controller says, okay, we're good. We had a successful disinfection cycle. I saw 140 at the return for 30 minutes, and it will record that as a successful cycle. And what's important about that is the building owner or the manager can say then, yes, I have a record in my uh, data logging uh, um, information here that proves that I have safe and sanitary water. So that's one of the big things that's really important in Europe is there's there are legislation and laws that require you if you own a spa or a hotel or something and actual inspectors will come around and they'll want to look at that documentation and verify that you're doing this. So this is the actual step-by-step -step procedure of how the Legio Mix does it. So it's fully automated. Uh, it, it goes into disinfection, runs a cycle, and then goes back to normal, uh, completely automatic. So, you know, back to what Bob was saying about the anti-scald valves, as long as you have those in all of your points of use, you can do this and it's safe. So I know yeah. that's a, a lot, lot of words, but hopefully no, um, exactly this gives you an idea of, of exactly how it works. No, that's exactly what I, I wanted to hear is the you know the the theory behind it because it's there's a lot of valves out there saying you know we can provide this uh, 
service or this function to your building, but you got to understand, you know, it's more than just taking that temperature up. Like Kevin said, this is the critical point. You want to know that all the piping in that building has been maintained at that temperature, not that the valve just elevated for a period of time. So that's where you have to um, know that by sensing that with a, uh, a sensor on the return, but also uh, data log that information because that's where it's going to come down to, uh, you know, the liability in the building if they have another. Uh, God forbid another uh, Legionella outbreak like they had in Philadelphia, and uh, you had equipment in there that was supposed to take care of that. Somebody's going to want to know, you know, how did it work, or you know, why didn't it work, or something like that. So that's probably the biggest part of that um, that type of valve is that having the documentation that can prove it, and it'll alarm, right, Kevin? If it doesn't get to that point, for let's say the the water heater couldn't keep up with it, or whatever the case might be, or the control in this was was off a couple degrees or something like that, the control will let you know that it didn't have a successful uh, uh, disinfection cycle, right? Yes. Yeah, it'll generate an alarm and it'll put that in the data logging uh, information that the uh, the disinfection cycle did not succeed. Yeah. So here, again, it comes down to what temperature we're going to use. You know, 160 is pretty hot water. And what you'll find is the, the life expectancy of whatever is generating your domestic hot water is going to be reduced greatly when you start going to those temperatures. So like Kevin said, if you can do it with 140, 150, that's certainly going to save some uh, you know, wear and tear and uh, give you a little bit more uh, life out of that. And the other thing we're trying to show here is just make sure that whatever the building is piped with, uh, that the pipe can handle that temperature. Some of the older buildings where somebody tried to maybe slip in some PVC pipe that's only rated at 140 degrees, and now you start talking about you know, 160 or maybe even higher for a period of time. Now you can have uh, problems with the piping in the building. So existing buildings that were uh, piped or you know, uh, buildings that had uh, a leaded brass in them, you know, if they had a recirculation pump and that was put in 20 years ago, you know, you want to be concerned about that because of the chemicals and the higher temperature now going against that leaded brass, you could have that issue, you know, some leaching out of that, um, uh, the lead leaching out of that older uh, style brass. So, yeah, there's a lot of things to think about. So, I don't want to overwhelm the, the people in uh, listening in tonight, but just, you, you know, you want to be educated on this when your customer comes to you. And wouldn't it be good if you were the expert in your, uh, in your area, in your town, that when somebody has a call, like this, said, you know, can are you the guy that can come in and you know set up a program for us, tell us what we have to do, update our equipment, so uh, we can meet all these uh, either mandates from the code or a mandate from the owner of the building, or um, you know, the federal government mandate, like on a, a veterans uh, uh, building, a veterans hospital, or something like that. They're some of the first buildings to mandate this, even if the codes haven't caught up with that yet. They want to know that the people that they're, uh, you know caring for are, are safe in those buildings. So uh, yeah, all those components there. <clears throat> this was a clever, again, uh, thanks to Ron for letting me use these slides. And I hadn't thought of this before, but here's another thing that can happen on this, uh, this dead leg. So, and this can happen, you know, if you've got a building that sits for a period of time, you can have a little bit of a, an air bubble because any air that's in that system is going to migrate up to high points in the system, maybe the upper floors in the buildings. Well, this little air pocket here can actually, uh, uh, act as a little uh, hydro pneumatic cushion. What I liken it to, some of you folks might remember, I, I don't remember, a plumber invented it, and I think Sloan bought the rice to it, but it was that power flush toilet that was out for a while, and every time you flushed it, the pressure would come back into that, and it would fill this kind of like submarine looking vessel in the tank with a high pressure charge of air in there, and boy, when you flush that toilet, don't be too close when you flush it, it just really blasted that down there. Well, that's the same thing that can happen here. If you compress this bubble in there, you can actually get this dead leg water now moving back into the mains and blend it with this out here. So even though you've run this main at an elevated temperature and you're pretty confident that you've had this, you know, um, treated with the high temperature, uh, dealt with the bacteria there, these dead end legs, even if you ran this faucet, you can have this condition here where that can flush back into that main if you don't get this out. And that's where it gets a little bit more complicated is you've got to go to every single tap, every single faucet uh, in a hotel, for example, think of every building, every um, shower, every lab faucet in that, uh, in all the rooms in those hotels and flush that out. And you still have the potential for this to, uh, for these dead end legs to go back. Even the building is shut off and nobody's using this, you can still get this contaminated, if it were water, back into the main that's maybe feeding the side of the building that is still in service. So, um, yeah, that's, that was kind of, you know, I never thought about it that way. But again, that's what uh, maybe some of the engineers think about. So, now there's other um, products on the market and coming on the market that you can deal with dead legs. This is one of the, um, I know one of the PEX tubing brands uh, offers a fitting like this. So 
what they're doing is they're trying to recirculate as far out as they can, which would be right up to the angle stop behind these lath faucets here. And they're using this U-shape fitting here. So as the recirculation water comes around, you've got now, of course, you still got the supply tube from A to B here that's, you know, could hold a half a gallon of water, whatever it might be in that faucet, that supply tube. But, you know, we're just trying to get it closer and closer um, to where the water is being used. Now, if you've got an old building, Obviously, you don't have a way to do this. You know, this has to be plumbed into the system. So there's other people that are looking at putting like little venturi fittings right here. So when there's flow going through there, kind of like a, a monoflow T, it would induce a little bit of a, you know, flow or a little turbulent condition and maybe try and blend a little bit of water uh, up into these little um, uh, supply risers going out to your angle stops and stuff like that. So, you know, once there's a... Uh, uh, that's where the imagineering and the engineering comes in. Once there's a need for something like this, people start thinking of uh, different ways of doing it, you know, a U-shaped fitting, a little venturi fitting, something like that, that we can, uh, you know, limit the, the stagnation in those, uh, those dead end legs. And this is the other thing. So for those in California, I know Gary, you're tuned in tonight. You know, there's always been the issue about running the recirculation, the amount of electricity it runs to run it 24 seven. So then we put timers on them and we put temperature controls on them and we shut them off for a period of time. Well, now the, uh, which one is it, uh, Kevin, the, the OSHA standard? One of the standards said, now we really would like to see those pumps running all the time. You know, now you got a little bit of heat loss and you got a little bit of electrical consumption, but that's the only way that you could assure that a fitting like this could do its job. You know, as yeah, OSHA and, and uh, ASHRAE 188 both suggest to, you know, not include that circulator in your energy calculations. And that there's yeah. some ASPE documents too that say, just, uh, you know, these, these new pumps, they don't draw very much energy right bob i mean they're really efficient yeah. so don't shut them off to keep the keep them keep the water moving and along those same lines i mean in any new buildings i know out in california they require what i think it's one inch wall insulation on this piping just knowing that that is a heat emitter as it runs 24 7 and now your air conditioning is working against that too of course so uh, you would want a smart pump you know a pump that could uh, modulate its speed to know what the demand is on this the the gpm demand i think i got some pictures of that coming up but also you want that piping insulated so you're not um you know the water heaters running all day just to keep the loop warm so yeah, there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle, and there's an example of, uh, you know, how much heat you can lose from uh, the piping going through a building. Now, this is an ambient temperature. Think if that's in, a, in a, a plenum space or something like that where the air conditioning is running while you're trying to keep this loop at a, you know, a temperature of 120 throughout the day and maybe 140, 160 at a certain point of the day. You've got that, um, that you know, delta T, that temperature working against you, so you can see the... Uh, the BTU per hour loss on just 100 feet of piping, you can see the difference that uh, even a, you know, a small amount of insulation can make. That being said, now you've got an older building where that wasn't done, now what do you do? Now you're going to have to take a hit on, you know, the cost of running that pump with un, uh, insulated piping. So, um, I think we talked about most of this, we're just going to go through it. So, this is what I was talking about, the, uh, you know, cross section of piping where you can have this biofilm. Typically, when you cut a pipe apart, maybe I've got one in this drawing, you know, it's coming up. You'll see this biofilm layer all the way around the pipe. If not, this is more like an aqueduct to me than a pipe, but, you know, it'll grow on all sides of this pipe. And the thickness of this this biofilm layer in here is, is you know, the key to how much bacteria can uh, uh, live in there, can, uh, you know, multiply in there. And that's why the temperature that, you know, whatever this water temperature, it has to get all the way through that layer of film uh, down to the very bottom uh, bacteria, if that's what you want to call that in there. So, and of course the bacteria that's going through with the water, which is what you typically inhale when you're in the shower and stuff like that. And I think we talked about this graph right here, kind of a catch 22 on this temperature graph. You know, I remember years ago when I was starting out in the business, you know, water heaters just came set at like 140, 150 degrees. Well, then there was a lot of people, you know, uh, getting involved with soft tissue lawsuits. So then the water heater manufacturers started limiting the temperature that the water heaters could go up to that you could physically set them up to. They started bringing it down to this. So the soft tissue lawsuits kind of disappeared, but now we got the issue with Legionella. So now we're going back to them and saying, well, we need the ability to raise that temperature up, you know, up in this range here. So now they're saying, well, you know, what's gonna happen with the, you know, people calling us, they're getting scalded again because their water heaters go up to high temperature. So, you know, it's always something, but, and that's why we're promoting the, uh, this type of valve, the point of use valve. And there's a lot of different options that can be built into a shower valve. Uh, there's a little, uh, you know, three-way thermostatic mixing valve that you might pipe in between a, behind a tub. 
Uh, we just came out with this little H pattern valve that goes in really nicely here because you just bring your hot and cold into the bottom and you just go straight up to your fixture here. So it takes a little bit of the, uh, you happen to build the, the T for your cold water coming into it. So it's just a little uh, wall mounted, uh, low flow, uh, highly accurate um, point of use mixing valve for sinks. Uh, what else on that, Kevin? I think we're getting down to the, to the end here. I got a little time. Any okay. questions coming in, by the way? I don't know if you, if you had a chance to look at those or Mary. I don't know, Mark. Are there any good ones in there? I've been a little busy with this other menu, but uh, I can I can take a look. Uh, yeah, we have some questions that came in here. Uh, let's start with. Um, I joined late. Is this? I think he's referring to the thermal disinfection procedure or technique. Is this a recommended for residential systems such as one to 14 unit apartment? Yeah, I would say it could be even an individual home, especially a, a home that's like a second home. Think of all the homes up in the mountains, the ski resorts or any resort, golf course, wherever, where you've got a condo or you've got a second home there that's just sitting there for months at a time with nobody using water. I would say those would be certainly a target for a, uh, uh, Legionella. So yeah, this, this it's, it fits all buildings. It's not just for you know multifamily buildings or uh, the public buildings or hotel type of buildings. If I had a home somewhere that was infrequently used, I'd want to come up with a plan uh, um, for that also. And it could be the same thing we talked about, just obviously a smaller version of a of a mixing valve that could do that uh, high temperature mode for a period of time, maybe a at some point, if we have a Wi-Fi version of that as you're flying in that day, you can have your temperature elevate before you get there and make sure everything's cleared but yeah that's a good question it, it's it's for yeah. any building that has you know water yeah it seems like yeah. it'd be more of a straightforward application because um well, for, for example you might not have the um complications that say having risers might present in um, recirculating you know enough um which is related to another question i'll ask in just a second and uh um and i think that you know probably the relative cost of trying to manage in a smaller building uh, other forms of um, thermal dis or, um, of disinfection could be costly whether it's chlorine dioxide or or what have you uv for example whereas uh, the thermal dis the thermal approach is like you said bob it's it's pretty much taking advantage typically of what you already have in place with it's a, yeah. you know it's not going to be degrading to the materials yeah, you just got to teach us some new tricks, basically, is all we're doing. We're using the existing equipment and just uh, turn it into a, you know, a smarter system. So uh, going back to, I uh, thank again to Ron George, this is, he started working on this a while ago and has put together, a, uh, I'll show you a couple pages, a pretty substantial, uh, um, you know, flushing procedure. I mean, it takes it out okay, you know, what size pipe you have, how many fixtures you have and stuff like that. Uh, anybody that's interested in that, certainly get a hold of Ron. I mean, that's the business he's in to help people with this. But uh, he does a lot of this for the code committees and stuff too. So you can see the, these are some of the pages that are in that, that document I just told you about the flushing procedure. So yeah, it's not a, a you know, it, it's, it gets involved. So I thought I'd just, uh, again, a shout out. Thanks for his uh, information and how you can get a hold of him if you have a, an application or building or you want to at least present this to somebody um, you know maybe you do a, a talk for your local chapter or something like that i'm sure he'd be glad to if you ask him for permission to to share this information because yeah uh, and we all learn together you know the more the more of us that know that the better right so we got for time here we can do more questions we got a, another trivia thing but if you've got a couple um, yeah uh, there's another there. question that came in from gary it's um as it relates to recirculation um what do we do about the branches um, of of the recirculation of the circulation loop. So mm -hmm. obviously that brings in you know a little bit of complication, right? Because now you got several circuits that. So maybe um maybe Kevin you might might want to talk about that, starting with the sizing of the circulator to begin with, but the, the problem with uh, circulating through a balancing valve, I guess. Yeah, well a branch kind of depends on what you're looking at, but if if it's if it's a branch that's off of the research line now this would be a, a small example yeah. of that right but instead of going to one fixture say you came off the research uh line and went and served you know three floors which which you mm -hmm. might might do as well the the point about minimizing the dead legs is always true you want to have piping uh you want to avoid piping with wh where you can get stagnant water so you either have to flush or come as close as you can to the fixture with your research lines 
um, it, it's all about stagnant water. Uh, no matter what you do as a designer or a, a building manager, you either need to flush or disinfect it in one way or the other. Um, yeah. And, and then in, in smaller area. systems, you know, you you brought up a question earlier, Bob, about residential. Um, in, in a house that does not have a research line, in other words, a you know, a, a single family home, uh, you might go through the, the whole, you know, amount of water in a single day, right? So then it's, it's not an issue, right? Because, for example, the water in, in my house doesn't get very old at all. I mean, with a couple of showers and some, you know, uh, so, some washing dishes and stuff, every uh, every bit of that water is replaced every day. So it's not an issue in a small residence. It's only when you get into larger piping systems and potential stagnation areas uh, that you need to be concerned about it. Yeah, and like I said, we don't have an answer for every single building. You just, uh, you know, that's the where your expertise comes in. You go to that building and say, okay, this is the type of building you have. Yeah, there's even commercial buildings, you know, some of the old buildings back in New England that didn't have domestic water, even big apartment buildings that didn't have a recirculation on now what do you do you know you've got a multi-story building and uh all this piping and no way to even uh to even recirculate through it so that's going to make that's where you get into the chemical option on something like that because uh unless you can retrofit a, a loop or a means of doing it now there's retrofit you know you've probably all seen those where you can recirculate the the hot through the cold water use your cold water's return i don't know and, and mixed feelings about that it's better than nothing at all i guess at some point but now you've got warm water in your cold water so now you're opening your cold water faucet to flush the warm water out if you want to drink a cold water so you know there's trade-offs there's pros and cons to all those different systems but um we're going to learn more about this as we go you know there's going to be clever inventions coming out somebody's going to hit on some unique uh uh, piping methods or fittings or whatever it might be to address all this because there's obviously a need there's a market out there and it's uh, uh that's what drives us to uh to build interesting things so yeah you, you touched on something bob that i want to mention um right, well, if, if you yeah. as a building owner or building manager want to add chemicals um what you are doing is taking on the responsibility of owning that water uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act, SDWA, um, actually talks about this and says if if you uh, treat the water that comes from you, the municipality in any way, then you are uh, oh, no. technically responsible for the safety of that water. So it's another good reason to use thermal disinfection. You get a master mixing valve that can do the thermal disinfection to protect the water because as soon as you add a chemical system or a chlorine dioxide or or, or any of those uh, after the water has come to your building, you, you own it. And that, that's also a legality. It's a really good reason to stay away from chemicals and go with thermal disinfection. Yeah, I mean, you're just gonna have to uh, look at the building and, and, and look at the options and uh, uh, what will help you with the thermal side of it. We're not chemical people, but if there's a need for you know what we do, we'd be glad to uh, to talk to you or help you with that. I, I kind of spoiled the next trivia question there a couple of times when paying attention. So uh, again, yeah, we'll go to that. I think we're about to the end here. Unless there's more questions, we can do those at the end. So there's the next uh, uh, trivia question. Once evaporated, a water molecule spends how many days in the air? And this, of course, it goes to the uh, you know, the Legionella being able to be transmitted through the uh, the mist or something like that. So we'll give you a couple seconds to think about that. And uh, thanks to Aaron, to, uh, the giveaway for this is gonna be the uh, copy of Pumping Away. That's a uh, that's a legend in the industry. That uh, that little book right there has probably made more people smarter in the hydronic side of the business than anything else that's out there. So thanks to Dan for writing and for Aaron for offering it here. So um, yeah, we'll just give you a second to think about that unless Mary, there's a correct answer already. Well, you know what? We've got a correct answer. Uh, Dennis said uh, 10 days in the air. I think All that's right. a bingo. <laughs> and well, Bob, I did want to just mention that one of our listeners must be from Illinois. Uh, Bill just said that uh, when you cited earlier in the presentation that uh, someplace in um, Chicago or Illinois was um, yeah. to raise that water temperature to 160. So he had a little bit of information on that, saying that that okay. was the state of Illinois was trying to mandate that to 160 degrees, but to date that has not been code. And that was as a result of um, a Legionnaire's outbreak in a retirement outbreak. home. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Oh, so yeah. that was the state. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I, I thought that was the city. Thanks for correcting me, Bill. 
Yeah, yeah we might have to get Bill a t-shirt too. What do you yeah. think? I, I do. Yeah, that, yeah. that's definitely t-shirt worthy. We're <laughs> <laughs> kind of easy, you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet that's a controversial subject up there is, you know, can we do that? And, you know, what's the pros and cons of doing that? And uh, everybody's got a stake in that. The, the people that manufacture the equipment, the people that have to make sure that their valves can handle that kind of temperature. So, and I understand the intent there, but that's a that's a big step, I think. So we'll see where that shakes out. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we'll have a, a, a thread going at the wall at Heating Help there. If you want to talk about this some more, if you have some more information that you want to share, uh, you know, we'll keep talking about the subject. We're not done with this by any means. We'll be doing more coffee with Kleppies that we do uh, Thursdays at uh, at noon central time. We're going to you know, be talking about this topic and uh, more products that we'll be coming out with to address this as we go too. So um, I think we probably have a couple of housekeeper slides. So there's Kevin over there on the right that helped me tonight. So he's a uh, certain tech support. He's now our product manager, but he certainly knows a lot about the support end of it and helps out. We all help out in all the different places in the business, but um, uh, Kevin's uh, responsible for looking at what's available in our other markets that we have already in Italy or somewhere else and seeing how that can work over here, you know, bring a product like the Legio, Legio mix valve over here saying, well, yeah, we're, you know, the U.S. and Canada is ready for that product. So that's Kevin's job to um, to stay ahead of the game and make sure that we've got something that's uh, nice and unique and uh, equal or better than what everybody else is doing out there. And I think in, uh, in the case of this right now, we've got uh, a pretty good mousetrap for it. So. Uh, if we can help you with uh, information or a product or something like that, uh, let us know. That's what we'd like to do. And the rest of the team there, tech support, Greg and Dan on the left, Cody's a, a tech support and a trainer. He works with me uh, uh, doing training for your folks, uh, webinars and visits and stuff. I think that's about it. Yeah, so that's the next uh, Coffee with Cluffy that's coming up. Cody will be doing that. We'll probably tag team a little bit on that. Cody will be the lead. I might be there making sure he gets it right. <laughs> So that's uh, September 24th, a little over a month from now, we'll be, uh, we'll be talking to you again. Let's see what else I've got here. Yeah, different places that we hang out that you can see us on LinkedIn and YouTube and uh, Facebook, Twitter, all the different social media sites. We try and maintain a presence there to answer any questions or show off some jobs or have a contest going on from time to time that you can uh, win some recognition and some prizes. So again, to make a long story long, thanks everybody for hanging in there at this time of day wherever you might be tuned in from anything else mark any other questions or anything that we could uh yeah here's a question and there's a there's kind of a trail of comments um associated with this and this is back to a a commercial system with risers um research system um and maybe i can direct this question to kevin kevin okay. are, is there anything that um can be done or Kalefi does that will that will um maximize the flush or capability of each of the riser circuits to get uh, disinfected um, the concern is that uh, the, it, probably the insufficient flow that typically happens in a secondary in the secondary circuits yeah use um if you're not familiar with uh thermal balancing valves those are the best balancing valve in the market to to, to make sure that each of the research loops uh, is balanced properly because they they control temperature. They they are a temperature solution to a temperature problem. So the thermal valve will modulate the flow. It'll actually open and close. That's also something that's unique about a thermal balancing valve. Uh, and so if if you think about um, say you have a a, a takeoff branch that's uh, too cool uh, for some reason that is. Uh, cooled down, the valve will open up and bring more of that recirculated hot water to that branch. Uh, so they work great in that they're, they're dynamic. So as the system changes, as uh, things open and close, they will respond to the changing dynamics of pressure and temperature in the research system. So they're a, a fantastic. Yeah, there you go. That's, that's, um, that's the hydronics issue you want to look at, number 21, that talks about recirculating and thermal balancing. Uh, they work great, uh, especially in conjunction with smart pumps that speed up and slow down. So what you're really doing is putting dynamic control into a basic research system, um, as opposed to using a fixed manual valve and a fixed speed pump. So these these valves respond, and and they work excellent when you are going to do elevated temperature and thermal disinfection too, because they can uh, work 
closely with that elevated temperature to make sure that each of the circuits gets um, up to temperature appropriately. And it's been such a successful product for us, Kevin. I think you're bringing in a larger size of this because people said, yeah, we love your valve, but on the bigger buildings, we need a little bit uh, higher CV of that valve. So I think uh, uh, you have a three quarter version coming in. Is that? Well, we have today a half inch and three quarter, which covers, mm -hmm. I'm going to guess, you know, 80, 85% of the time, but we have one inch and one and a quarter inch coming out real soon too. So okay. um, for those larger research lines that serve a multitude of fixtures, they may be one inch or even an inch and a quarter uh, when okay. you have a big uh, research riser. So uh, those will be available pretty soon. This is likely to get to be a, mm, I won't say crowded market, but up until recently, there hasn't been too many manufacturers supplying this type of valve into the US. In Canada, um, probably the pioneer was uh, a company called um, Thermo Omega Tech, yeah. and uh, they've been, you know, working in the engineering community for some some time now. There's a stainless valve. I don't think it's adjustable like ours, but more recently, um, Exilum. I guess this is full disclosure. Exilum has a, a thermal balancing valve line, as does um, Kemper, um, or maybe it's, is that it? Kevin, as far as the manufacturers, adjustable. yeah, yeah, for, for adjustable, yes, that that's it for now. I mean, there, there are others, um, you know, looking at entering this market, but yeah, it's uh, like like you said, the the market was really defined by that circuit solver by Thermal Megatech, and they did a great job working with the engineers. But now that people understand it to be, is it completely different animal, right? It's it responds to temperature. Uh, and modulates. And once you get the idea and you see how they work and what a problem solver they are, then uh, I mean, that's that's really um, a booming business right now. Yeah, and that's a retrofitable valve too. It's not just for new construction. In fact, if you have a building that's having balancing problems, which is why I was in Oklahoma City here a couple of weeks ago, and they had a, a hospital building on there that from day one, they've had problems with balancing that domestic water recirculation. So this is a, an application where they'll go in and they'll retrofit not only these valves, but they'll put a Delta P pump in there so that uh, recirculation pump will modulate as these valves open and close, the pump will uh, uh, you know adjust along with it, change its output. So their pinholing issue, it's been going on for 10 years and that building uh, hopefully will go away as well as getting a, a handle on their, uh, their balancing issues or temperature fluctuations in that. So, um, yeah. We still have over, um, looks like over 80% of the people that started the uh, webinar. Um, time, you got time for another couple questions, Bob, Kevin? Yeah, I do. I do, yeah. sure. Okay. So this was a comment. I'm not quite sure when it came in and what part of the topic, but a comment was, I do not understand recommendation for non-aerated faucets. Non-aerated faucets. Was there a recommendation for non-aerated faucets? I didn't have it in here, but I understand what he's saying because that's what the aerator is doing is, you know, bubbling that water. I mean, that's the, I think the original intent for aerators, as I remember, is so when you put your hand under a stream of water, it doesn't splash all over you back whenever we first started seeing aerators on faucets. But, uh, and of course, now they put uh, flow restrictors in them also. But um, um, Yeah, I snuck that bu bullet in there, Bob. Sorry, sorry oh, yeah. about that. Um, but I, that actually came up in an engineering presentation that, you know, the, the faucets, when you open them, it's just a nice laminar flow that just sort of flows out and doesn't spray all over. Yeah. So, so uh, it, it, you know, that's a very small thing, I think, but it could uh, reduce aerosolizing the water, right? So um, specifying those is just another little thing that can be done to reduce the amount of of water droplets that could be inhaled, maybe if you're washing your face, you know, or um, splashing yeah. water. So, good um, point. Good question. Something good for somebody to catch that. <laughs> All right. Anything else, Mark? Or uh, yeah, I, here's a question. The legion mix. This is my question. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned the Legion mix. You showed the schematic where the Legion mix actually sends an output signal uh, to a recirculation pump to energize it. Is that is that right? Um, well, it, it closes a contact, and you can wire that contact in parallel with whatever is controlling that recirc pump. To yeah, to, to increase the head of the of the circ during the um, disinfection process, since you're taking advantage of the recirc pump, 
which might be set for just basically, you know, just imparting enough, you know, uh, flow to give you constant temperature at the at the faucet. Is there a way of um, bumping up the the speed of that pump to, you know, high speed in that process of closing that contact? Can you, if you if you got your um, pump set on a, a certain value for your calculated, um, you know, um, no demand situation, um, and now you want to go into thermal disinfection. Is there a way of adding more head to those those risers to get more flushing, if you will, by taking advantage of the higher speed of the of the primary pump? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Can you can you turn those pumps? Output, so. Oops, sorry. If can, we can, you, can you can you output on a Kevin that that could drive a you know pulse width modulation or some kind of signal coming out of the control instead of just a dry contact. Uh, which would be uh, over here on the rear. It's just, like I say, a dry contact that you could drive that. But, you know, if that was a delta P pump, that would respond to the thermal balancing valves. But if you wanted to just boost that up to high speed, uh, like Mark was talking about, you'd have to somehow get a signal to that. I mean, there's pumps that can take those signals. I don't think we have that signal uh, built into the control right now. No, we just have the relay. I mean, I, I suppose you could add a double pole, double throw relay and... Yeah. You know, if, if you yeah. had a pump that would take another digital input and turn it up to full speed, you know, theoretically you could do that, but I don't know of any. Yeah. Okay. I guess it would have to be, yeah, especially designed for the for the application. Um, here, here's another uh, question as it relates to safe um, opening. You know, one of the things about the use of thermostatic mixing valves is even even though they're not billed as a um, self-cleaning valve, they do respond to pressure and temperature that causes the, a little bit of a wiping action within the valve. When a building is, um, when a building is um, uh, in disuse and those valves aren't exercising, and eventually you do come back on, is there an issue concerning thermostatics that could cause it to, if you have an older valve, that it, now it might really start acting erratically and therefore unsafely? Yeah, I mean, if you get a scale buildup in there that that cylinder or piston, whatever you want to call it, or cartridge, uh, can't move up and down freely, they don't get, um, it can stick in there in one position or can hunt around where it's kind of a jerky output. So, uh, yeah, that's certainly a potential. That's, you know, the more mixing valves you put in these buildings, if you start putting one at every sink in that building, you're going to have to maintain those valves. You know, all valves that see water at some point need to, you know, uh, have service or replacement if, if you have hard especially if you have hard water. And the other thing we talked about, if you go to these elevated temperatures, the higher the temperature of the water, the more the minerals precipitate out of that water. So if that valve sees that all of a sudden 140, 150, 160 degree water, it's probably having more potential to scale up than it did at 100, uh, you know, say 30 or 40 degree, uh, assuming you're mixing down to 120 on the on the mix side of it. So yeah, it's going to be a, and that in the, in the legio mix, we tried to build that function into it where we can uh, we can turn that ball in there, kind of like a windshield wiper, and clean that off. Because think about it, that valve is probably only operating in a small range most of its life. You know, it's got cold coming in, it's got hot coming in at a consistent temperature, not moving much. So uh, it can get a little scale build up that if it does have to move, you know, for high demand or you get a, a fluctuation in your hot water temperature and it's got to move. Um, that's when you can have an issue. So by exercising it, by turning, I think it goes one way and it goes the other way, doesn't it, Kevin? 180, 180, something like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. It'll exercise that ball so you can uh, wipe that scale off, so to speak. So it should be um, a little less maintenance prone than some of the cartridge types that are just sliding up and down. Um, a, a, a related question. Um, it, this just came in from Todd. Is there a Legionella risk with domestic residential wells? I think there's a Legionella of, of risk anywhere. I mean, even cold water at a certain temperature can have a Legionella. And that's the thing, you know, uh, I'm thinking like uh, Phoenix, Arizona, you know, I lived down there one summer. I think the water comes out of the mains there in the summertime at like 85, 88 degrees in some summers when it's under that hot asphalt. So certainly uh, uh, Legionella can uh, live and grow in those temperatures. I would think the safer water would be the water in Milwaukee in the wintertime where it goes down to 35 degrees and those above uh, storages that probably isn't thriving in that water. But uh, yeah, if you have water in the building, even the ambient temperature in that building, you know, can start bringing, I think we had that graph. Did we have a bacteria graph there, Kevin, that shows that where it lives and reproduces and what uh, temperatures it, uh, it starts to uh, really enjoy the 
piping. Yeah, that slide you had that kind of showed the cutaway with the bacteria living in there and then the, the temperature graph next to it. So one thing to remember is that Legionella is everywhere. It, you know, it, it really is uh, uh, just a matter of controlling it. You're never going to eradicate it 100% uh, pretty much no matter what you do. We just need to control it. And the, the way to do that is to keep keep the hot hot, keep the cold cold, you know, keep it moving and keep it fresh. That's a quote I picked up from one of the Legionnaires, Legionella the conventions. And if you think about that, if you keep the cold cold and keep the hot hot, then you're 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 minimizing the you know the proliferation of that bacteria, and uh, keep the water moving to keep keep the uh, bacteria down and and keep it fresh because bring it bring it in fresh water that's water from the municipality or from the well right the water that comes from your well is yeah. probably safe when you pull it right out of the ground right um 55 degrees, yeah 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 Try to see if I could find that slide quickly. Sorry about the jumping around, but yeah, I mean, like I said, we've got uh, we've done other presentations on this, and we'll be doing more. So we've got other slides. You know, I would certainly steer you towards some of Ron's uh, um, articles this that he your, writes, as well as some of his. No, is this it? Let me bring it up more. There you go. Ah, there you go. Thanks, Kevin. Good eye. Yeah. So this kind of shows you the temperature scale and what happens at the different uh, uh, temperature ranges. So. And remember, it's a time and temperature. There are two variables when it comes to killing Legionella. If you look at that 140 degrees, for example, it says 32 minutes. Well, this is like laboratory conditions, right? If you have a, a pipe that has a lot of slime and, and uh, a lot of buildup inside, you're, you'll have to use you know higher temperature or go for a longer time. So these are like ideal conditions. So you really want to be above 160, up in that red zone up there uh, in the kill zone. And then if you have a nice clean pipes, then you can have a pretty short uh, cycle, you know, but uh, if you have old dirty pipes, you may have to circulate 150 degree water for an hour to protect. And the way you know that eventually is by testing. You need to be able to test that water and you yeah. can, adjust your schedules accordingly uh, and as long as you keep testing it and, and make sure that it's safe then you can reduce either the temperature or the time one of the two uh, un until you know the point where you start to see that the concentration is getting to a dangerous level so that's how you maintain it and I, I think that's probably somebody in the state of Illinois saw this graph and said well here's what we want you know we want to get in this sh shorter time frame and maybe that's where they were trying to come up with these temperatures up in this upper range yeah. I don't know but the, the, yeah like Kevin said that the time and temperature thing and if, if you've got a building where you don't want it at an elevated temperature for any longer than absolutely necessary then that's where you go you know the higher temperatures yeah and, and storing at 160 is a good idea right because it, as long as your tank is okay storing at that temperature, then if you want to do a thermal disinfection cycle, you just start drawing you that don't water. You yeah. don't have to wait for your source to heat that tank back up, right? So you're just storing it at 160 all the time. And at any time that you want to, you can start pumping that water to kill bacteria. Well, and then you extend your hot water from that tank also at the elevated temperature. If you're storing at this and you're mixing it down the, you know, let's say down here, typically 120, 122, then you got a little more capacity out of that, but like we talked about earlier, you're probably going to shorten the life of that that vessel or that tank that's storing at the elevated temperatures. You know, there's trade-offs to all of this stuff. You just have to find the, um, you know, the sweet spot or the spot that works for you and your customer, and you know, just kind of customize it. It's like any other um, job in our trades. You know, if you're doing a heating system for a customer, you want to kind of design it to you know, their needs and their building and what they expect out of it. Uh, it's just when it, we start talking about Legionella, now we get into a, you know, health safety. So it's a little different. <laughs> you know, if you got a cold spot in the radiant floor, you're probably going to live through that. But, uh, you know, if you're susceptible to a uh, bacteria, like Ken was saying, the boomers and stuff that are in these retirement homes, that's how we need one of these days, probably, you know, that's where we've got to, um, we got to come up with a plan. You got to protect these yeah. people. Well, it's a cost versus risk, right? You can say, oh, I, I can't afford to put uh, anti-scald valves at every fixture, or I, I can't afford to, you know, keep my storage at 160. Well, okay, you know, there's some good arguments there, but uh, the cost of one outbreak is is brutal. You know, uh, you can shut down a hotel 
uh, in a downtown city for two months. You know, the cost of that is just huge. So it's uh, that's what it's about. Yeah. Todd's question was uh, uh, domestic systems, uh, residential systems on wells. But I guess the question I would have, maybe Kevin and Bob, um, do you hear much documented cases of Legionella, let's say major cases, deaths, as it relates to single family and typical residential units, or is it primarily the commercial sector we're talking about? Yeah, you won't see that in a, in a single family residence um, because you, normally you're going through all that water every day, right? An average family uses, what's the number, Bob? I can't remember, um, you know, way more water than is stored in the piping in a home, right? Yeah. So all that water is replenished every day. So it's not an issue for that kind of uh, residential application. How about a second home? Yeah, yeah that's, that's yeah. well, then you've got stagnation. Bob talked about that. Then you're looking at stagnation. And if, if you do have a, a lake home or a ski home, uh, when you go there, you, you really need to flush out everything for a significant amount of time. Okay. All right. I think that does it on the questions uh, from what I can see here. Okay. Well, thanks again, everybody. And thanks, team at Cluffy, for working with me on this. And uh, We'll see on a coffee cloppy. We've got some other interesting things too. We've got some uh, podcasts coming up that we'll be talking about here shortly. So we'll um, we'll be in touch with you folks. Thanks, Bob. You Aaron or anybody, but I think that's just, there. We go. Thanks, Aaron, for Thanks. helping us with this. Thanks so much. Good night, everybody. <laughs>